Kobe Brown is a first round NBA draft pick, but what do we think about the fit with Mexico, Missouri native Tyron Lou? Well, let's talk about this and some football too, right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. Thanks for making this show your first listen every day. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get audio podcasts, including now the SiriusXM app as well. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, today, we got to start with Kobe Brown, who is a first-round draft pick. And if you'd have told me that before last season started, I'd have probably thought you were crazy, and I would have utterly questioned your ability to analyze basketball. But after the season, well, a heck of a lot less surprising when Kobe goes through 150-plus three-point attempts, makes over 40% of them. My goodness, I think he might owe Dennis Gates and the coaching staff some residuals there because frankly, if he'd have stayed with Conzo Martin for another year, I just don't think this is possible. I don't think there's any world in which Martin allows Kobe Brown to become this type of player. And again, I'll be honest with you. I didn't think he had this in him. Did any of you think Kobe Brown was a 40% plus three point shooter? I I just didn't see that coming, but you know what? At this point, he goes through a whole season. You got to believe it. And I think I think, obviously, the Los Angeles Clippers believed it in a big way. I think, obviously, most mock draft outlets had Kobe being a a sort of mid-second-round type pick. So for the Clippers to jump up and grab him there, give him the guaranteed dollars that comes with being a first-round pick, well, they obviously have some belief in him. And you know what? If you're a big Clippers fan, as apparently there are some Missouri fans out there who are Clippers fans, because I actually got a message this morning from somebody who calls himself Boss on Twitter. Well, what up, Boss? Good to see you. Good to see you out there. But he says, before you start your show, I feel like as the resident Mizzou Clippers fan, don't expect much from Kobe this year. Tyron Lou doesn't like to play rookies, and Paul George and Kawhi Leonard have a lot to prove this year. Super excited to have him, though. Well, that's good insight, a a good comment there, because it is true. I'm an NBA guy. I love following professional basketball as well as the college game. But yeah, typically Tyron Lue, not a guy who is going to play rookies a whole lot. But typically, you know what? Obviously, the Clippers have been a good team for the most part lately. Obviously, the Cleveland Cavaliers, well, he won a championship with them. They were always trying to get veterans out there and win an NBA championship. Well, next season, at least in the regular season, I I don't know that Tyron Lue is going to have much of a choice but to play Kobe Brown. If you if you know what the Los Angeles Clippers have done the last few years, well, you mentioned Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Those guys have massive, massive contracts. The, the roster for the Clippers, long story short, they don't have a ton of flexibility to go out and grab a bunch of guys in free agency, for instance. So whoever the Clippers took with that 30th pick, the last pick of the first round, they were going to need that guy to play at least significant minutes in the regular season, at the very least. Come playoff time, well, who knows? But again, regular season, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, you just want to get them to the playoffs at this point. They're basically the poster child for what has become called load management in the NBA. In other words, hey, we're just going to take some games off now and then just to not get too much tread off the tires, that kind of deal. Well, if that's going to happen, guess what? Kobe Brown's not only going to play, he might start a few games this season when there are those sort of load management moments. So overall, obviously, I'm really happy for Kobe Brown. I think this is a good, not great landing spot for him again I'm glad as I said on Twitter earlier today I just wanted Kobe to go to a relatively good organization and team I'm glad he didn't end up as a Houston Rocket 
or a Detroit Piston, for instance, or anywhere else that's seemingly a long way from actually contending. I think he could have easily gotten lost in the shuffle in that type of environment without any real sort of stalwart veterans to guide him and to guide his career. And, you know, again, when it's a bunch of uh, young guys on a losing team, they're sort of fighting for shots and minutes and touches and all that good stuff. I'd much rather him go to a team that is more veteran laden like the Clippers and, and with a veteran coach like Tyron Lue, who's obviously been around the league for, for 10 years now or however long it's been. A guy who played in the league for many, many years as well. So I think this is, a, a again, a solid landing spot for Kobe. I don't know that it's perfect, but I like it. I really do. And one thing, man, two and a half million dollars guaranteed next season for Kobe actually two the next two seasons he gets about that much money I do believe that contract could be up to four years but I'll tell you one thing I did think as much as I think the young guys are probably excited about Los Angeles I'll just say from my perspective I've visited LA before visited lots of places in this country LA not my favorite I gotta be honest but maybe Kobe will find it a little differently I'll just say that that two and a half million dollars would have gone a lot further in Cleveland than Los Angeles. I'm just saying, old Kobe's about to learn what California State and L.A. City taxes are all about. Get a good accountant. That's my first piece of advice, young fella. But regardless, this is a great, great day for Kobe Brown and his entire family, the Missouri basketball program. And as a fan of Kobe Brown these last four years, I'm just absolutely thrilled for the guy. So congrats, Kobe. Can't wait to see you at the Staples Center. Or wait, crypto? Yeah, that's what they call it now. Regardless, it's going to be a good time. By the way, as I've pointed out several times on this show, I really thought that Damari Carroll was a good doppelganger for what I thought Kobe Brown could become in his career. A, a guy who didn't shoot a ton of threes, maybe. Well, obviously, Kobe did his, his senior year. Damari Carroll never really shot a ton of threes in college, but obviously became an excellent three-point shooter in the NBA. Well, also, Linus Klaza may be a pretty good example, too. Another guy who went late in the first round. Klaza went 27th in the 05 draft. Carroll also went 27th in the 2009 NBA draft. I think both of those guys are pretty good examples of forwards who expanded their games out to the three-point line and ended up making a pretty solid living doing so. In fact, I can now think back to Linus Clays' sophomore year at Missouri, and I just remember him shooting a ton of three-pointers, and me and everybody else was going, man, can we get this guy a little bit closer to the basket? But I don't know. There obviously was a little bit of a method to Clays' madness there, and maybe it was a little bit ahead of the curve there, I have to admit. But you know what? Speaking of ahead of the curve, you're always going to be ahead of the curve if you listen to this show. Thanks for being here, as always, and coming up on the program, we got to talk more about the Missouri quarterback situation. Obviously, Gabe DeArmond, if you've been listening, if you're an everyday or well, he had some words that made me question if Brady Cook is as much of a favorite to be the starter as I thought. And what about playing multiple quarterbacks the first couple weeks? Again, let's talk more about the Missouri quarterback position. But first, I want to tell you about Bird Dogs because Bird Dogs, not only are they versatile, they make you look really good too if you've got a nice set of legs like well this podcaster i'm going to tell you bird dogs is going to make them look even better the girls are going to go wild for your gams i can promise you that and even better bird dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry and yes confident all day long nobody wants gross sweat stains so go to birddogs.com slash locked on college and you'll get a free yeti style tumbler with your order again that's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler you won't want to take your bird dogs off we promise you that thanks for making locked on mizzou your first listen every day and every dayers well next week we're going to talk about pff's rankings for Missouri's corners and wow they weren't nearly as kind to Ennis Rakestraw and Chris Abrams drain as they were Missouri's linebackers or defensive tackles I gotta say I got a bone to pick with PFF so be sure to tune in next week for that discussion but I want to get to the quarterback position once again no not cornerback right now but the QBs because as I said previously 
starting to rethink how much of a favorite I think Brady Cook is to start right now. According to Gabe DeArmond, he thinks it's a true open competition. And I want to quote Gabe here from a few days ago. He says, the more I think about it, the more I wonder if Eli Drinkwitz carries the competition into the regular season. Any of the three, the three meaning Horn, Sam Horn, Brady Cook, and of course, Jake Garcia, any of the three should be able to beat South Dakota and Middle Tennessee. So I can see a scenario where two or maybe even three, although I think that's unlikely, quarterbacks see action in the first two games and Drinkwitz isn't 100% sure on who his full-time starter is until the week of the Kansas State game. I think the competition truly is that open. Listen, I don't really have a dog in this particular hunt. I really don't care who the Missouri starter is next season. Obviously, I just hope Eli Drinkwitz picks the right guy and that guy goes and lights up the scoreboard next year for Missouri. Again, whether it's Cook, whether it's Horn, whether it's Garcia, as long as they're good, as long as we win eight games or more, whatever it is, I'm going to be happy. But what Gabe just put out there to me is the nightmare scenario. To me, you've got to pick a quarterback by week one. I don't care who it is. Again, doesn't matter to me. You just got to pick one and go with it because this is an important season. And anytime, if you want to win, you got to pick a quarterback. I'm sorry. What, what is the example of there being two quarterbacks that played significantly? Again, unless you know what your role is as the backup. If you know you're going to play and you know, for instance, back in the day, James Franklin, as a true freshman, I believe, when Blaine Gabbert was the starter, 2010, hey, James Franklin sometimes would come in around the goal line as sort of your de facto short yardage running back. You know, they'd pound him, they'd spread the defense out, pound him in through the middle and get a touchdown, that kind of deal. Hey, guess what? That's fine. In fact, the, the, I believe the 06 Florida Gators who won the national championship when Tim Tebow was a true freshman. Well, when Chris Leak was the starter, they used him similarly. It's like, hey, use this Tebow kid who's 6'4", 230, whatever he was. We'll mash him through the middle and get some first downs and short yardage and goal line. But Chris Leak knew he was the starter. There was no doubt that, hey, when we're going to come out for the first snap, Leak's going to be getting the ball. It's first and 10. Yeah, he's going to be taking the snap. So that can work, but to me, the, oh, am I going to start? Am I not going to start? Who's going to play the second quarter? Again, Gary Pinkle made it work when, hey, Chase Daniel would get a series here and there, whatever it might be. But again, you knew the plan there. Brad Smith wasn't looking over his shoulder at the start of the football game. So to me, again, that's a nightmare scenario for Missouri. If we're going back and forth the first two weeks, you know, okay, there should be able to beat South Dakota and Middle Tennessee. My God, we lost to Middle Tennessee, what, in 2016, I do believe? Let's not guarantee a victory against any Division I team at this point if you're Missouri. So, I don't know. To me, pick one and go with it. This whole idea that, hey, we can just take, a, take the competition in the regular season. Please, Eli, I'm begging you, don't do that. Now, I did have one comment on YouTube that stood out to me. And this person says it looks like getting your top recruits zero field time in two years is bad for your recruiting efforts. Who knew? Well, you know what? There's some truth to that criticism. Now, you could come back and say, well, Luther Burden played a ton as a true freshman. And Dominic Lovett played a ton as a true freshman. Dalen Carnell got on the field pretty early last season. No doubt about that. But overall, I think this is a really fair criticism of the Drinkwitz administration so far because, listen, why haven't we seen Sam Horn throw more passes? Were there not opportunities to put him in the ball game last year when Missouri was getting was blowing people out or getting blown out in a couple of cases against Kansas State and Tennessee? But certainly early in the season and, and against New Mexico State when Sam Horn threw, what, two passes or something like that, one of which may not have even counted because of a penalty I, I just don't understand that why are you not using those reps and those opportunities to see what you have in some of these young guys I'm not saying push the highly recruited the high star guys ahead of veterans just because that's not what I'm saying I'm saying again in garbage time when there's no reason to really have your starters out there you've seen 
you have enough film on these guys at this point. Let's see what the rest of your roster actually looks like for real. And again, particularly with Sam Horn, it's just bizarre to me that Missouri fans, the fans out there who are clamoring for Horn, I kind of get it. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you have nothing to go on. Unless you watched him play in high school, what what in the world are we even going on at this point? Just his high school recruiting rankings? Well, unfortunately, an individual's high school recruiting rankings don't mean a whole lot when you get to campus, right? So, I, again, this isn't me bad-mouthing Horn or anything. This is more me saying, agreeing with this YouTube commenter, like, hey, let's get some of these young guys on the field a little bit more. In particular, why... Haven't we seen more out of Sam Horn? It just feels like more should have been revealed about him by now than it already has. And coming up, speaking of recruiting rankings, it doesn't seem like Missouri has a great chance at five-star defensive lineman Williams Winery. But are the Tigers wasting their time? Let's talk about that after these quick words. So Lee's Summit product, Williams Winery, who some think is the best defensive player in the country, best defensive line, maybe even just the best player, period, in high school football, the best prospect out there. Well, obviously, the Tigers would love to get him on campus, and the word is Winery is going to be in Columbia today, possibly tomorrow as well. And for this idea that, hey, is Missouri just wasting their time here? Isn't inevitably, isn't he going to go to Oklahoma or Georgia or Tennessee or wherever it might be? Well, yeah, if I had to bet, I certainly am not betting on Winery to be a Missouri Tiger. I still think you have to try. If he's willing to take an official visit to campus, you have to take him. I just don't even think that's debatable. So while ultimately this is going to be a whole much ado about nothing, if you're a Missouri fan, I still think big picture, it's better to get him on campus than not. At the very least, it signals to other big recruits, hey, go come to Missouri, whatever. Hopefully, you, you roll out the red carpet, maybe literally. I don't know. Maybe we have a red carpet somewhere in the back of Jesse Hall. I don't know. But for real, you just try to make the best impression you possibly can. And you know what? Kids talk. High school kids, high school players, the big-time prospects, they all kind of know each other at this point. They end up meeting each other at camps what have you. They all have Twitter DMs and Instagram DMs and all that stuff. So to me, I think people are missing the big picture a little bit here if you're only worried about the specific recruitment of Winery himself because, again, if you're the Tigers, you got this big-time guy who's willing to take an OV. You just got to do it. And finally, one more Missouri basketball note here. It appears that Phil Pressey is no longer going to be with the Tigers next season. Reportedly, Phil is leaving Missouri to take a position with the Boston Celtics. So, by the way, speaking of guys who played in the NBA, Phil Pressey had a cup of coffee in the league with the Warriors and the Boston Celtics. So, obviously, he's going back to an organization he knows a little bit. Brad Stevens, a really smart guy now running the Boston Celtics, was the coach, of course, for several years there as well so seems like a pretty good landing spot for flip so best of luck to you coach flip honestly i'm a little sad i was hoping flip would hang around a little bit longer than this but hey when you're a young guy trying to get into the coaching game you got to go wherever's best i do wonder if maybe pressy saw one look at the new landscape of college basketball with transfer portal nil and all this stuff and went "Woo, what's all this gee maybe i should maybe it's actually easier to be a professional coach at this point. It seems like you got a whole lot less nonsense to deal with, honestly. It's like, okay, we're just dealing with basketball, right? And the front office gets to deal with the agents and all this stuff. Man, if I was a college coach right now, I'd be looking at the professional game kind of longingly right now, I have to admit. A lot less headaches. That's just me. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you disagree with me. Hey, all you everydayers, thanks for checking out the show. As always, Like I said, we've got plenty to talk about next week, including why I think Eli Drinkwitz should be going for it on fourth down much more frequently this season. So until next time, I'm John Miller, and thanks as always for listening to Locked on Mizzou.